Hello again. Uh, this is Lecture 2 of the Intro Introduction to Radar Systems course, and in this lecture we'll be discussing the radar equation. As I mentioned in the first lecture, at the beginning of each following lecture, we'll bring up and show you the radar system block diagram, and we will give you the context of that individual lecture within that radar system block diagram. Rather than focusing on one individual piece like the transmitters and receivers or the antenna or propagation, this lecture will discuss the radar range equation which connects all of the different pieces of the radar with the target and the distance from the radar to the target. That radar equation, as I just said, connects the target properties, which are the target's reflectivity, or its radar cross-section as we call it, the radar characteristics such as transmitter power and antenna aperture, and the distance between the target and the radar, i.e. the range to the target, and also the properties of the medium the atten in atmospheric attenuation, and that sort of thing. Okay. N first, we're going to go over an introduction to the radar equation. Then, we'll look at uh, the surveillance form of that radar range equation. We'll go over the different losses that can uh, so-called, I call it the humanity of the radar, the inefficiencies in the different uh, components and subsystems of the radar that contribute to the uh, losses in the radar equation. We'll look in, in detail at an example of uh, the, how the performance of an individual radar example is calculated, um, and then we'll summarize. Okay, now let's start off with uh, deriving the radar range equation. What we're going to do is to go over from basic physical principles how the radar equation uh, evolves. We're going to just need algebra and, and our reasonable good physical intuition. Now let's start where you'd think of with the radar transmitting a pulse in the simplest possible way. Transmitting a spherically symmetric uniform pulse of energy uh, with a given power in that pulse, and it's ra uniformly radiating out spherically. That peak power of that pulse of energy we denote as P sub T, the peak power of the transmitter, and at any distance R away from that transmitter, the density of power is given by the, that peak power divided by the area of the sphere because that density of energy is going to diminish as the sphere gets larger and larger. It's the power per unit area. Okay, If you say you had a small area on the sphere, the power density on a small, at a given point would be the overall power divided by all the area in the sphere. So at a given arbitrary distance from the radar, the power density is that P sub T divided by 4 pi R squared. Now in practical radars, we don't transmit power out in all directions. There's one, uh, it, we use an antenna to shape the beam and send the energy preferentially in one direction. And as we mentioned, it went over in the first lecture, that directivity that we give the, the beam it, it, it is characterized by a quantity we call the gain. And it's the power the gr that you have in excess of the power that you'd have if you were transmitting in an isotropic spherical wave. So let's just slowly reiterate it. The gains, the int radiation intensity of the antenna in a given direction over that that you'd get from a uniformly radiating isotropic source. And that gain 
it can be written out uh, as four, it, 4 pi times the area of the antenna divided by the wavelength squared. I haven't given you a, a derivation or a physically um, intuitive understanding of that. We'll talk about that later in the uh, antenna section. But that gain is that greater amount of energy you'll have over the spherical radiating energy. So if we want to write down and modify this above expression for the power density of an isotropic antenna, the power density from a directive antenna is just the first expression multiplied by the, the gain of the, of, the, of the transmitter, transmitting antenna, excuse me. Okay, now that, that wave going out towards the target is going to emit out till it gets to the target. And that a power density will impinge on the target. And the radar cross section, which is elect electromagnetically the size of the target, it's the electromagnetic area that the target sees, it's a measure of the energy that is radiated back towards the radar that's intercepted and scattered and goes back to the radar. And we call that sometimes the RCS for the initials radar cross-section and it's usually denoted in equations with the Greek symbol sigma, a small sig sigma. And its units are in meters squared or area. Remember I ca called it an effective area. Now if the power of the reflected signal at the target then would be the power density which we just had, times that area. Power density times the area will be the power reflected at the target. Now that energy will be reflected back and again will undergo um, a diminishment of 1 over r squared as it, and times 4 pi as that wave expands out so that the power density received at the radar is given by this expression, just the power of the reflected signal at the target divided by another factor of the area of the sphere back to the target, 4 pi r squared. And notice that the power density of the reflected signal falls off as 1 over r squared. Now, back at the target, the received power is just the power density at the radar, which we calculated in the previous view graph, times the area of the receiving antenna. So again, multiplying the received power density times the effective area of the antenna. This is A sub B. And this gives us the power of the reflected signal at the radar. Very important factor. So that's the power that's received back at the radar from the echo of the target signal. Okay, now competing with that power of the echo is background noise. Remember we, sh I, we showed you a graph of the noise that the receiver would hear if there was no target, no echo, no transmitter, no nothing. Just turn on the radio, radar receiver, turn up the volume, and there'll be some ambient noise. So what causes that ambient noise that we want to see that very small uh, few microwatts of power in? And there are a number of different physical effects that cause it. Some of it is galactic noise. That's noise that comes from other galaxies that's in the microwave reach frequency range. Uh, noise from the sun in the same, that would be in the same frequency range that you're listening in your radar. Noise that's generated in the atmosphere, lightning, which will generate some energy in, in that spectrum. And uh, a little cartoon here for lightning. Also, there can be man-made interference. Interference from other nearby elect electromagnetic sources like radars, radio stations, things like that. Or it could be um, uh, deliberate uh, deliberate transmissions to raise the floor noise in the, in the receiver of the radar so that the radar would be ineffective. We call those jammers. Okay. 
and, and then noise that could come from lots of different sources reflect off the ground and go in the, the side lobes, the, the places in the antenna that don't have a huge amount of reflectivity, but they all add in together. And then, of course, there's going to be noise that comes from the uh, portions of the receiver and the waveguide till it gets back into the, into the depths of the receiver. Okay. Now, we characterize the noise power as Boltzmann's constant times the temperature, and we have a, a, a bandwidth factor in here. Intuitively, when you have uh, like an atom, it's moving back and forth. It, when you heat it up, it, 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 uh, it, it gains energy. And that amount of energy that it gets by being heated up um, is Boltzmann's constant times the temperature that you heat, heat it up to. Okay? And that's the amount of energy. Now, the power would be the energy per unit time. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to characterize all these different noise sources by an effective temperature that we're going to multiply Boltzmann constant by, but that's an energy, and we have to divide that by a time to get the power, and the time over which we're looking is just the pulse width of the radar, or that how the size of the pulse, and one over that is a good is the bandwidth, the, the frequency range over which we're operating, and that the receiver is listening to, and that's that B sub n, and that's measured in hertz. So the effective power of the noise is Boltzmann's constant. It's shown over here. It's a universal constant, and it's measured in energy per degree Kelvin. Now, um, so there's many different sources that the noise can come from. And what we do is we represent them by a single noise source at the output of the antenna terminal. Now, what are we left with in terms of the equations we've developed? We've got the signal power right up here, that's at the, and then we've got the noise power. And the ratio of those two is the signal to noise ratio. So we just take this set of quantities divided by that, and we have this equation right here. Okay. Now the signal to noise ratio, and we call it S slash N or SNR, is the standard measure of a radar's ability to detect a given target at a given range from a radar. And the way we would state that is we'd say the signal to noise ratio of a certain radar is 13 dB, but always we'd say it's on a one square meter target, as an example, at a range of 1,000 kilometers. And that statement is a statement of the detecting the detectability characteristics of, of a radar. Notice if I take this equation and I plug in a certain cross-section, and I plug in a certain range, then all the other parameters are the properties of the radar itself innately. Okay. So this, this says that uh, um, is, is a statement of the, of the ability of a certain radar to detect a one square meter target at a thousand kilometers. Okay. Now, I told you about the system noise temperature being the sum of a lot of different characteristics. And this is how one calculates that total system noise temperature. It's divided up into three components. Apart from the antenna, apart from the, that's the contributions from the uh, components in between the antenna and the receiver, and apart in the receiver itself. The contribution from the antenna includes the apparent sky temperature, and you can get that from a standard graph in a radar text. And it depends on the angle you're looking in the sky and the frequency of the, of the radar, that sort of thing. And also it includes uh, uh, heating ohmic losses, so-called ohmic losses, within the antenna itself. Then there's the contribution for the, uh, the microwave components, the so-called radio frequency and microwave components, between the antenna and the receiver. And they're all lumped into one effective temperature. And 
Then there's a, uh, a component for, that, ha that characterizes the actual noise that's innate in the receiver. And there's a, uh, a, a term called the noise factor of the receiver uh, that, that is related to the, to the temperature of, the, of that receiver. I'm not going to put that equation down for simplicity in this course. Later courses we'll go into that detail. But it's effectively the temperature of the receiver and then also the loss uh, of those input microwave components within the receiver. So when you put that all together you'll come out with a certain temperature in degrees Kelvin that you plug in the radar equation. Okay, now we want to go to the surveillance form of the radar equation. And why so much the surveillance radar equation? Because what we've just done is we have derived just previously, and here it is, the radar equation when the location of a target is known and the antenna is pointing towards the target. If you think in that whole set of logic I went through to develop the radar equation, I had the antenna pointing directly at the target. So you might say, well, gee, what if I know the antenna, the uh, target's up in the sky, but I don't know where, and my beam is relatively narrow. I've got to look here, listen, look there, listen, look at another angle, and listen. Look at a whole bunch of angular positions uh, that, uh, that might be in a rectangular uh, solid angle or angular area or a horizontal uh, set of beams we call a horizon fence and, and go back and forth looking for targets. And, um, that form of the radar equation is called the surveillance form and it, you have to manipulate uh, this algebraically this to put one in the form of the other. Okay. Now when we do that we come out with this equation on the right. And you can see what we want to do is we want to say for a given radar, one of my parameters of saying how well the radar will work is I have to say how big a volume do I have to, angular volume do I have to search? And that's characterized by a solid angle, which is the angular space I have to keep searching to find the target. And it's also characterized by a term, which is the time it takes to do that. Okay, and, and in this form of the equation, we convert the peak power to the average power through the duty cycle and the time between pulses that we talked about earlier. And, but this is the form of the search equation. Okay, and this is the form of the track equation. So when you could imagine, when you build a radar, you're going to have two different functions. First, I want to search for targets. So you develop a radar that would have an, uh, the appropriate power and aperture and to be able to have sufficient signal-to-noise ratio to perform its search function. But then after you've, you've developed the radar to do that search function, you want to make sure that it can, it can perform the track functions you want to uh, have it perform also, and you'd use this form of the radar equation. So when you do the design process in a radar, you're going to use both forms of the radar equation. Now let's look at the search equation for a few minutes in a couple of different view graphs. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll just draw some measure from it about physically intuitive things and trade-offs and just to get, give you a feel for what, what these algebraic quantities mean. Now we can take this algebra up here, which in some sense it isn't. Well, let's just poke and move over to one side all those parameters which are design parameters of the radar. The power, the aperture of the radar, the uh, system noise temperature, uh, and the losses. They all have to do with what the, how the engineers would build that radar and design it. Then on the other side of the equation, there's a few constants. In one case, I put Boltzmann constants here because that's natural, the sort of with the system noise temperature and the four pi is over here. But the, all the other quantities over here are performance parameters. How big a solid angle can we cover when we do search? How far out can we perform search and range? Um, 
and what's the quality of our measurements, the signal-to-noise ratio? How much time is required to do that search? And what size targets can we see? These are all performance characteristics. Okay? So you see, on the one hand, you've got the stuff you want, the, the requirements you want the radar to do, and on the other hand, you've got the engineering characteristics that the designer has to build. And if you want a certain set of performance parameters, you've got these things at your beck and call that you have to build the radar with enough power, big enough aperture, etc. Excuse me, etc. Now, let's rewrite that equation from its original form of signal to noise ratio is equal to all those parameters to one where we put power on the left, the average power, and everything else on the right. Okay? And let's look and let's see, hey, the power that's required to do the job, it's independent of wavelength. You don't see wavelength appearing anywhere in here. Interesting point. But if we brought back the, uh, I'll go back quickly to view graphs, we go to the track equation, the wavelength comes into play. Okay. So we have the power, uh, it's independent of wavelength, and it's a very strong function of R. We'll get into that. But everything else, it's, it's linear in everything else. You know, if you want uh, double your signal-to-noise ratio, you've got to double your power. If you want a half the area, you've got to double your power, that sort of thing. Now let's look and see how strong that R to the fourth character, that really makes a big difference. Say we have a radar, it can do its job at a thousand kilometers. It can do search out to a thousand kilometers of range. Well, how do we have to modify that radar to be able to do the same job at 2,000 kilometers? Well, this one solution is we can increase, to increase the range by a factor of 2, or 3 dB. I'm going to use this as an example to get you a little more used to using dBs if you're not. I, can, I have to increase the power by a factor of 16. If I double the power from 2 to 4, that range number goes up by a factor of 16, which is 12 dB. So I'd have to increase my power well over a factor of 10. Not 100, but you know, somewhere in between. Incredible. Huge amount. I'd have to increase the or I could increase the diameter of the antenna by a factor of 4, 6 dB. Or the area by 12 dB. Okay. Big, you know, well over a factor of 10. Um, or I could increase the time I scan by 12 dB. Or, or increase this, or decrease the solid angle that I can see. If I want to see out farther, I can't look at as many different angle cells by a factor of well over a factor of 10. Or I can take pieces out of each one of those. But the thing I want to point, use this to point out is that the radar range equation is a very, very strong fact, uh, function of the uh, very strong function of the of the, the power required in the other parameters. A very strong function of R. Hello there again. Now we're going to start part two of the radar equation lecture, which is part of the second lecture, which is part of the Introduction to Radar Systems course. First, we're going to just for a moment recapitulate the last view graph from the first part of the lecture. There, we were looking at scaling the search radar equation. Here was the search radar equation. We cast it algebraically into a form where we had the average power equal to all of the other parameters. We noted that the power required is independent of wavelength, 
It's a very strong function of the range, and it's a linear function of everything else. By a strong function of the range, you can see this r to the fourth power. Okay. Now what does that mean? Now let's say, for instance, we have a radar that will work and, and perform its search at a thousand kilometers range. What do we have to do to modify that radar to work at 2,000 kilometers range? Well, we have to increase the range by 3 dB. What do we have to do to get there? We can increase the power by 12 dB, or 16 times, the diameter by 6 dB, or the area by 12 dB, 16 times, by increasing equivalently the scan time of the radar, decreasing the solid angle that the radar looks at, or by increasing the cross-section that we're able to see. In other words, we'll be able to only see targets that are 12, 16 times bigger. Or in a, a combination of those factors we can put together, redesigning of the radar. So you have to do quite a bit to double your range. All the other things, we can trade off one for another. For, that's as much as to say, um, if we'd like to see a target half the size, we double the power. If we want the, the antenna to be half the size, we'd have to double the power. It isn't that strong function that the art of the fourth carries with it, that strong influence. Now let's move on to today's part. First, we're going to start off by looking at five different radars. These are all radars that are used for civilian purposes in the United States, so it's very easy to talk about their parameters and their missions and what they do. And here we have a graph plotting as these dots are the, for the five different radars. The average power versus the equivalent antenna diameter of the radar. By equivalent, I mean the, if, if the antenna was circular in nature, its, its size was circular in geometry, what would be the diameter of that circle? Some of these radars, as you can see here, this airport surveillance radar, there, it's, it's a more rectangular a paraboloid is a nice way to, just to describe it. Rectangular surface. Uh, but if the surface was circular, what would be the equivalent diameter? And over here we plot the average power. And we're looking at the search radar performance. Now, first let's look at an airport surveillance radar. Now, this is an airport surveillance radar, an ASR-9. They, and with the FAA is built by the FAA, um, uh, for the FAA, I should say, by Northrop Grumman, this one is. And these are used at all the major airports to detect aircraft and track aircraft within about 50 or 60 miles of the terminal area of that airport. There's enough of these radar, radars, hundreds, so that they have overlapping coverage over the entire United States, pretty much. Okay. Um, these radars also, you can see another antenna above here, and that's for the beacon tracking. The radar is a non-cooperative sensor, you understand, and whether the target wants to be detected or not, if it has a, a reasonable cross-section, uh, you can illuminate it, get a backscatter, and uh, detect it. With this beacon system, which operates in tandem, in parallel with the skin tracking radar, so-called, um, a signal is sent out at L-band, 23 centimeters, and is sent out to the aircraft, where the aircraft have a receiver transponder uh, on it, where it listens constantly, the receiver on the aircraft does, and when it receives, sends a message out, it's literally a coded message saying, hey, I'm a beacon system, uh, tell me where you are, and who you are, and what your altitude is. Then, after receiving that signal, the uh, beacon system will send back a signal, and on it will be coded a message with the altitude's height, with the aircraft's height and identification number. And this is uh, obviously an ideal system, but many times on small aircraft, Sometimes they have beacon transponders and 
private uh, aircraft don't work. The big commercial aircraft have do, uh, redundancy for this. But both systems are employed for safety for the FAA, and both are used. Um, now you see where that uh, radar fits on this power, average power, equivalent diameter curve. It's got an average power of about a kilowatt, but it's got a peak power actually um, of about a megawatt. So it's got about a, a one thousandth is the duty cycle of that radar. It transmits its pulses about every millisecond. And its equivalent diameter is a couple of meters, in the order of a meter or two. Okay. Now let's move on to another radar. Uh, this is one that's um, located at most major airports, and most of the time it's, it's located on top of the air traffic control tower, where um, air traffic controllers visually look at what's going on at the terminal. So it's several hundred feet tall. It operates in the so-called KU band. It's the lower portion of the microwave band. Uh, a uh, frequency a little under approximately two centimeters, a uh, centimeter and a half. It's 16 and a half gigahertz, approximately. And it, the inside this white pancake-looking uh, ray dome, a ray dome is an enclosure that the radar antennas are put in to protect it from the elements and the radomes are made of a material that the microwave radiation will go through with very little loss in, uh, in power. Uh, and it's rotating around uh, at 60 revolutions per minute. Its function is to look out along the runway and see um, taxiing aircraft so that the uh, air, tra air traffic controllers who are guiding the aircraft that have just landed and are about to take off to make sure that one isn't going to crash into the other. Uh, and also to keep an eye on vehicular traffic that is around the airport to make sure they don't get in the way. And generally the airport's ground environment is, is safe and secure. Okay, These are very high resolution radars and that they operate uh, here we see the uh, its location. It's got a fair-sized antenna, but it's got very, very low power because it only needs to see out uh, um, seven kilometers or so. You know, about the distance of a runway and a little more, so to speak. Okay. Uh, next, we have another class of radar: air route surveillance radars. And here we see it. That's a lot. Got a lot more average power, and uh, and it's got quite reasonable size. And here's uh, the. These are there are uh, quite a few of these located around the periphery of the country, uh, particularly, and they look out about 200 miles. When there were fewer terminal radars, they would fill in gaps in the coverage where there weren't airports that had the uh, requirements for an, a an actual air traffic control radar. But they're, they're generally for keeping track of the aircraft that are at high altitudes um, along the coastal areas and doing, they, they're operated jointly with the uh, Air Force and to do air surveillance to see what aircraft are coming in. You can imagine there's a large corridor of aircraft coming in from Europe into the Boston Washington, New York area, and there's another corridor of aircraft coming from Hawaii, from the West Coast to LA and uh, San Francisco, and they keep track of these aircraft that are coming in from foreign, uh, foreign um, locations coming into the United States and keeping uh, board of understanding that these aircraft are doing all the right things from an air traffic control point of view and an air defense point of view also. Okay. Next, we have the uh, so-called NEXTRAD. That means next gener. It's an acronym for next generation weather radar. Its nomenclature is WSR88D, uh, and we see it over here. And we see of all the radars, it has the most, pretty close to the most average power. It's right up there with the ARSR4, and it's got a pretty large antenna diameter. Now, its job is to look for at the weather conditions all over the country. 
there are, there are just uh, the, the entire country is plastered with these radars and any time you look at uh, your local weather forecast you're looking at one of these NEXTRAD radars. They operated S-band. S-band is a frequency that quite readily sees precipitation and echoes from weather. And these radars have characteristics, which we'll talk about later, that allow them to measure the uh, Doppler velocity of the targets they see. And their target is the, the, the rain and precipitation, that diffuse it's a diffuse, windborne uh, a, a target. And to characterize not only its radial velocity by measuring the Doppler shift of the rain cloud uh, echoes from the carrier frequency that was transmitted, but also measure the radar reflectivity, which we'll talk about intensity. And with sophisticated processing with these radars, they can tell all sorts of things. Is there a tornado front coming? Uh, by, uh, um, they can p deal with predictive issues with the weather so that the weather forecasters can put these, these data into their models and predict where the weather's going to be in the next four and eight hours. But as you remember, when you look at the weather forecasts, they show you a time history. Ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum of the last several hours uh, or hour or so of how a, a weather front has been moving into your local geographic area. And they're updated every few minutes. It's, this is uh, the beam, it, the dish inside this is a parabola. It's a very fine beam and, um, and it, it, it scans back and forth around uh, very slowly and carefully so that it's measuring uh, the weather in your area very precisely. Okay. Next is a specialized weather radar that's just located near airports that tend to have turbulent weather, tend to have a, a, a phenomenon called wind shear. Uh, and the, this wind shear where the, the, uh, can cause uh, a, a, a meteorological phenomenon called microbursts. This is particularly dangerous when um, uh, aircraft are landing or taking off. And the characteristic when there is a wind shear in the area is think of a, uh, uh, a circular area where the, 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 the wind is coming up and then going down. At one side, as you're coming in, it's going up, and in the other, it's, the wind is, has a downward velocity. Now, when the pilots would be coming in for a landing, they sense this weather pushing the aircraft up, and they want to stay on the appropriate glide slope. So what they do is they push the aircraft to compensate it with the elevation um, equipment on the wings, uh, the gear on the wings so that the aircraft will go down faster but unfortunately when they get on the other side of the microburst the, the, there's a flipping sign and the significant force pushes the aircraft further down uh, this has led to it reinforces the already pushing down of the aircraft that they were trying to compensate in the other direction to balance and pushes the aircraft literally right into the ground and this phenomenon before these terminal Doppler weather radars were developed and, and employed um, caused a number of significant crashes with a lot of loss of life and because of that these have been employed and uh, now the air traffic controllers can see that this hazardous weather uh, the systems have an uh, automatic mechanism for spotting it and can ring a bell and say, hey, watch out there, there's some microbursts. Anyway, um, and then they can go over and say, hey, don't use that runway, let's shift to another runway because there's a microburst over in the area of this runway. And these are deployed in the country and do their job. Since they don't have to see out as far, they're also looking at weather, weather of the same size and cross-section. Um, there, there's less need for them to see further out in range because they're dealing with issues closer to the airport 
and they can uh, have a detection range that's significantly less. Okay. Now, before I go on, I just want to point out that in this graph, all these curves have been normalized so that they are searching uh, one steradian of solid angle in 10 seconds and looking at one square meter target with a signal to noise ratio of 15 dB, the losses of about 10 dB, and that system temperature of about 500 degrees. And, but it's a, it's a, th these parameters aren't the required characteristic requirements um, in terms of detection for these different radars, but it just shows you the different relative powers. I just note that if you were building a radar to see um, up in space satellites it, on the power antenna curve, it would be way up here. And if you're, you're a policeman with a handheld police, radi uh, police radar that's trying to catch speeders, you're only talking about a, you know, a quarter of a mile or so with a relatively large cross-section target of an, of an automobile, and you'd be way down here. So radars fall all along these lines. And remember, these scales are logarithmic and go from an average power of one watt up to 100,000 watts, and, and diameters from a tenth of a meter all the way up to 100 meters. So radars of all different kinds fill up this entire region. And I just wanted to highlight uh, five different radars that are used with civilian applications uh, and what their relative power and how they work. Okay, now let's go on and go back to that issue of radar losses. Now, I said that the, the radar loss terms in the radar equation uh, are the humanity of the radar. And that is to say, they're the lack of idealism uh, in terms of how you get power from the transmitter. And, and I've divided it up. You can see here under the, the transmit chain and the receive chain. Uh, but let's just think about the transmit chain, and that would be from the transmitter till we get to the target. And it, in order to do that, you have to go through waveguide, you have to go through ray dome, all sorts of things have to be taken into account. And when one is designing a radar, you have to take into account the losses if, uh, as, as the transmit beam goes through the ray dome, if it has a ray dome, uh, the waveguide feeds and the waveguide themselves, the circulator, which is that switch. Uh, there are filters that you can put in the transmit chain. Uh, there's a joint. If you have an antenna that rotates mechanically, like the airport surveillance radars, uh, the ASRs and the ARSRs, there's a joint where the microwave energy goes up as the, and, it, and it has to go up through and then to the feed. A, there are losses in that um, rotary joint. Is the efficiency of how efficiently the energy goes out into the transmitter. And when the target is illuminating, uh, the radar is illuminating the target, is the radar pointing directly at the target or a little off? If it's a mechanically rotating antenna, maybe the target's a little off and it's not on the peak of the uh, gain pattern of the antenna. And there are a number of other um, uh, losses, a loss through the atmosphere after we, and uh, I'd like to just point out also the issue of fuel degradation. When one builds a radar and builds it as a laboratory instrument, um, it will work to a certain level. Then after a radar is out in the field, uh, the transmit doesn't quite generate exactly the power that it was specified to. It generates just a little bit less. And one by one, over time, the, all of these different hum pieces of humanity of the radar, the losses increase. And so in, in time, when you take a radar out and operate it in the field, and many radars are transportable. You take them, you can put them in an airplane, take them apart into subsystems, and then set them up. They just don't quite operate as well. They're very complex entities. They don't operate as well as they would in a laboratory environment. So usually um, sensible radar engineers 
when they design a radar they put into it a certain field degradation because after a while you want to you want the radar to work five and eight and ten years after you build it those are just the losses on the transmit side and we have a whole series of losses on the receive side also that deal with the signal coming back from the target all the way back to the receiver and they're pretty much a lot of them the same but after you get back to the receiver there are losses in the processing that take place now notice I've said loss 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 I haven't said plus 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 anywhere and that's one of the key things about this whole issue the radar you build is the best you can hope for usually and so you really have to be very careful because if just each one of these parameters were off by a tenth of a dB or two tenths of a dB there are probably 25 parameters here then the whole radar signal to noise ratio would be down 5 dB and the detection range of the radar would be very severely degraded so when people are designing radars they have to be very keen and very careful about putting in the appropriate and exact quantities that are realistically expected from these. Uh, depending upon the mission of the radar and the type of the radar, overall the total of the transmit and receive losses can vary from 5 to 15 dB. And 10 dB isn't at all an unrealistic number for the total of these losses. Uh, particularly when you consider that how many of them there are. Okay. Now I'd just like to go over a number of different losses in particular and talk about them uh, to give you a little more of a physical intuition of some of the main losses. One I talked about earlier, and, and this is particularly in scanning antennas that mechanically scan, uh, the radar return is modulated by the and uh, the, the antenna as it moves across, the gain of the antenna is higher. It's sort of the detective as you see the target and the target moves into your beam as you move the antenna to over the uh, azimuth where the target is located, then you, you, your signal to noise ratio will increase and decrease, consistent with the antenna pattern as you go into the main lobe of the beam up to the peak and down. Now, the, so therefore the return is going to be modulated by that antenna beam. This beam shape loss can be two, in and of itself, just one loss, can be 2 to 4 dB. Okay? Uh, there's a scanning antenna loss for phased array radars where when you go and point the antenna in the direction where you think the target is, it's not quite there. So you can be off board, board you can be, uh, uh, not where you expect to be, excuse me. The scanning antenna loss is for phased array radars. When you build a phased array radar, and we'll get to what they are later, they're an antenna that has a beam shape when you're pointing perpendicular to the phased array face. And the beam shape broadens as you go off the antenna shaped face. That can be quite significant. So if you've scanned 20 degrees off the perpendicular to the face of the antenna and you're detecting the target there's a significant loss in gain of the antenna and that is this uh, scanning antenna loss. We, we, this is what we call so-called plumbing losses and these are the losses as we transmit the energy up and down the waveguide and transmit and receive and the rotary joints and circulators. These can be 2 or 3 dB. It'll depend a lot on your frequencies. At the higher frequencies like at X band, 3 centimeters, the uh, loss per 100 feet of waveguide is significantly more than at lower frequencies. And then there's a lot of signal processing losses. Signal processing can do great things to help you uh, see small targets in the presence of clutter. But as we do that processing, there's a loss when we do the A to D quantization, when we apply adaptive thresholding uh, systems, uh, so-called constant false alarm thresholding. You'll learn what these are later. But I just want and range and straddling and ra range straddling loss and range and Doppler weighting losses. 
We'll talk about them somewhat later. Um, but these losses, there's a significant number of losses associated with signal processing that can be a dB or two. And we can't forget the loss in the atmosphere, and that's a two-way loss. And as you'll see in the next lecture on propagation, the attenuation loss at higher frequencies can be quite significant. When we do integration, uh, there's a, if you non-coherently integrate pulses, that most of the time that's not as efficient as coherent integration. And uh, they, you can have a loss there. And then I went into the field degradation loss. Um, a reasonable loss for that to put in is I usually put in 3 dB when I'm doing radar design issues. Uh, you can have water in the transmit in the waveguide. It can, can leak in. Uh, the receiver's noise figure can degrade over time and poorly tuned or weak transmitter tubes. These are things that just happen in time. And of course some of these you can fix with periodic maintenance, but between the periodic maintenance some of these issues can occur and the radars don't quite perform up to Welcome back for part three of the radar equation lecture in the Introduction to Radar Systems course and this is lecture two. Okay, now let's look at one example. And with that, I'm going to take you through the radar range equation once for one radar carefully so that you can get an idea how this, this equation, how we deal with it, and how we do the algebra. And so we're going to start off with a problem. We're going to, we, the problem I state is show that a radar with the parameters listed right here uh, will get a reasonable signal to noise ratio on a small aircraft at a 60 mile range. Well, I just mentioned a little bit before that a radar like that was an air, the, the airport surveillance radars, the ASRs. And this is pretty much what ASRs parameters would be. Um, and a small aircraft would be a single engine, uh, privately owned aircraft, the Piper Cherokee or something. They typically have a size, a radar cross-section of about one meter squared. And the range we'd like to see that aircraft out to would be 60 nautical miles. And uh, the peak power of that radar is 1.4 megawatts. The duty cycle is uh, uh, one half of uh, its, uh, let's see, a half times 10 to the minus 3. The pulse width of this particular radar I'm talking about is uh, 0.6 microseconds. The bandwidth, that's the frequency shape, you know, how over what width of frequencies we're sending energy is uh, 1.6 megahertz. The frequency of the radar is S-band, 2800 megahertz, which is about 10 centimeters. And this, these antennas rotate 12.8 RPMs, about every 4.7 seconds, uh, seconds the radar goes, makes one revolution of 360 degrees. And while it's doing that rotation continuously, it's emitting pulses out at a rate of 1,200 approximately per second. And the antenna size is 5 meters high by 2.7 uh, meters, excuse me, 4.9 meters wide by 2.7 meters high. And it actually has some beam shape losses because it, the way the antenna does its shaping is to have good coverage at high altitude. So its effective antenna size is a little smaller. I'll go over that over here. And the beam width is about 1.3 degrees. And for this particular radar, we have about a 950 degree system noise temperature. I mentioned in passing this 2800 uh, um, megahertz, million cycles per second, corresponds to about 10 centimeters. And here we do the calculation. Turns out it's exactly, it's 0.103 uh, meters. And to calculate the gain of this antenna, we have its antenna size. Remember I mentioned it's four, earlier it's 4 pi a over lambda squared, which would give us 42 b, dB, but actually it's 33 dB because we have a huge beam shape loss to shape this beam so that a lot of extra energy will go in the high elevation angles. So aircraft that are in the terminal area that are up at high elevation angles will, will get good, uh, good strength of the beam. It's called, 
I'll, we may get into it later in the antenna section. It's called a, a cosecant squared beam. It's where the gain is constant at a given altitude up to a range and then comes up. You pay for that in the beam shape, as you can see. There's a 9 dB loss in order to get that coverage up at the high angles. And the number when you do the algebra of seeing how often the um, how fast the antenna rotates, uh, there are, as the uh, the target whizzes by a, a uh, excuse me as the beam uh, rotates by a target, we'll have about 21 pulses on the target. We we're up in uh, within two or three dB of the maximum of the beam. And we're going to assume losses of about 8 dB other than this loss of 8 dB uh, in the system. Okay, now let's calculate what the signal to noise is we get. So here is the uh, track signal to noise ratio. And we see it's got the peak power, the gain, wavelength, the cross section, some constants, K and the 4 pi to the cube, the range the system noise temperature, the bandwidth, and all the losses. And from the previous page, here are just what these quantities are. And if we, first I'm going to do the calculation in scientific notation um, for the physicists and the scientists in the crowd, what they'd be used to. So I've just put down uh, a 1.4 times 10 to the 6 watts. Uh, the gain, 33 dB, and natural units is 2,000. We've got the gain twice, so the gain, 2,000 and 2,000. And then the wavelength, I've rounded the wavelength to 0.1 meters. It's 0.103. And uh, so 0.1, because lambda squared, I've got it twice. And then 1 meter squared for the cross section of the target. Then we move down, and 1984 is 4 pi cubed. And then we have the range to the fourth power in meters, the range of 60 nautical miles transformed in, transforms into 1.11 times 10 to the fifth meters, and that's 111 kilometers. We have to put that into the fourth power. And then we have Boltzmann's constant, 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 watts per hertz per degree Kelvin. Uh, the, the temperature, the system temperature of 950 degrees, remember that's in the units of Kelvin. The loss of 8 dB in natural units, and remember you won't want to take, you don't want to mix dB and, and natural units when you're doing this. We're doing this all in natural units this time. Next time we'll do it in, in dB units. And then, uh, and then we have the bandwidth in Hertz. And notice I've made sure that we're all in uh, MKS units, meters, kilo, uh, kilograms, and seconds. We have watts and meters, so I'm not putting meters up here and kilometers down here. You want all the different units to cancel out. And if you look very carefully, you'll see they all cancel out. You'll see that up here we have uh, watts, and the watts cancel out. And we have meters to the fourth power. Here, meters to the fourth power. Uh, this degree Kelvin cancels that one, this hertz cancels that hertz, and we just have a ratio, a, ra a power, a ratio of two powers. So when we take all the numbers here, uh, we have the 2, the 2, and the 1.4 give us 5.6, and then we take all the different powers, and they're right here, of 10, and then down below we do the same thing and we get 415, and all these different powers of 10, and then bump it down to uh, increase, uh, move this to a, uh, a number between 1 and 10. And we end up with 1.35 in natural units, which now we'll go back to dB. It's 1.3 dB. Now, that means per pulse we have a signal to noise ratio of 1.3 dB. Now, if we have 21 pulses and we coherently integrate them. If we take a uh, logarithm to the base 10 of 21, we get 13.2 dB. And we add the integration gain, and lo and behold, we get a signal to noise ratio for the total of those 13.2.
uh, 21 pulses that will see the target of 14.5 dB, which is a good signal-to-noise ratio. If it will be plenty above the noise and will have good detectability. Great. Now let's do exactly the same calculation in logarithmic units. We put down all our same parameters, only we first take the logarithms of the numbers. And again, changing them to natural units before we take the logarithms. 1.4 megawatts, and if you remember back, that's on the top of the equation. So that's in plus dB, that's 61.5. The gain is 33 dB, but that's squared, so we add logarithms, 66 dB. The wavelength is 0.1, which is minus 10 dB. Twice makes it minus 20 dB. It's in the top, but it's still a minus. The cross-section, again in the numerator, is 1. Logarithm of 1 is 0, so that gets a 0. Now we go to the denominator of the equation. And these should be mostly negatives, unless the two negatives make a positive. And in the 1984, when you take the logarithm to the base 10 of that, you get 33. We take the range of 110 kilometers, but remember, we have to take that to the fourth power, which means take the logarithm and then multiply it by 4. And that total number is a big number, 201.8. Notice how on the negative side of things, that range really comes in strong. Then we take Boltzmann's constant, which comes out to be minus 228.6 because of the minus in this exponent. But it's on the bottom, so it becomes a plus. The minus becomes a plus and comes up here. The system losses are about near a thousand, almost a thousand, twenty nine point eight dB in the negative side of things. Then the losses, eight dB on the negative side, and the bandwidth of one point six times ten to the sixth comes out to be sixty two point two. So what we have here are a whole bunch of positives, and remember, these are exponents, and when you deal with exponents you add them. So we add up all these numbers and we get 356.1 and all the negatives 354.8 grand total of 1.3 dB. When we integrate the 21, same as before, when we integrate the 21 pulses we're adding another 13.2 dB and we come out with the same number. Yay! 14.5 dB. That's just a nice way of showing you how the radar equation works both in natural units and in logarithms. I want to make a couple of points about now generally about the radar equation before we finish. Okay. Uh, the radar equation uh, is simple enough, and this was said by a colleague of mine, Steve Weiner, that everyone can learn to use it. It's complicated enough that anyone can mess it up if you're not careful. And one of the reasons I put that example of the radar equation in is you can use it as a template. I have a lot of Excel spreadsheets uh, that I use. One can make up an Excel spreadsheet. And if you've got the units all right in your spreadsheet and you know what units you're supposed to put in, the algebra will all set, it, and set itself right. So, but the thing is, it's a simple set of uh, algebraic expressions. It's nice sometimes to have a template, whether you think in terms of dB or natural units, you can or scientific notation, you can go through it. One thing about the radar equation you want to do is say it's a, do some sanity checks. Take a candidate radar system, and here's that uh, form of the radar equation, which has all the characteristics of the radar and all the characteristics of the, the performance characteristics, the requirements and check it dimensionally. Make sure that all your units, and I implicitly, I might have said it lightly, make sure it checks out dimensionally. And you, you, and you have the right units everywhere. See if it makes sense that when you do a calculation with one range or another range, increasing the range and signal to noise make the requirements tougher. And uh, decreasing the cross-section and the time make the requirements tougher, etc. Well, now we're going to look at how the radar equation, 
and the detection process all fit together. And that's shown uh, figuratively in this block diagram. We're going to spend a few minutes going over it. It'll be a really good recapitulation of what we learned in Lecture 2, the radar equation, and it will show how the results of what you do when you calculate the signal-to-noise ratio of a radar in, uh, using the radar equation fit into the whole detection process of asking the question, uh, is a target really there when it uh, appears to be there? Is that a detection from noise or is it a detection from the real target? Now, we've learned in this lecture that the radar equation connects the properties of the radar, the pr characteristics of the target, the range to the target, and the properties of the medium. And let's just go over them one at a time. We've, we, uh, the properties of the radar, which are going to contribute to how strong the signal is in an average sense relative to the average noise power are the radar transmitter power, the antenna gain, that's how directive the antenna is, the frequency of the radar, the pulse width, uh, and the waveform that we're using. So all of these characteristics that feed into the radar equation are parts of the radar, the parameters that the radar designer can, has in its control, or her control. Then there are the characteristics of the target. It's uh, um, effective electronic area, uh, how much of the incident wave of a, a microwave energy from the radar is reflected back towards the radar. And that cross-section, that cross-section, effective cross-sectional area, electronic area of the target, will depend on the uh, angle that the target is, just uh, and also the frequency of the radiation. Uh, and relative size of the wavelength of the um, radiation to the size of the target. Now, uh, it'll depend on angle for just about every target except the sphere, because a sphere has the same cross section no matter how it's oriented. But for most targets, say we had a big flat plate, a flat plate, oh, a meter by a meter, uh, and it was a half an inch thick. If an incident electromagnetic wave hit that plate uh, and the plate was perpendicular to the radar, a large amount of energy would be reflected back. That's called the specular, and we'll learn about that and those kinds of issues in the lecture uh, on radar cross-section of targets. But if the plate was located at an angle, uh, just like uh, light is Bet, uh, is uh, reflected when it hits a mirror, a large part of the energy would go off in another direction, and, uh, and it turns out for a radar only a small amount of it would be reflected back. So it's a, the target cr characteristics, particularly its cross-section, are going to depend on the angle and also the frequency of the radar. And we'll see how it depends on the frequency of the radar uh, later on in the, in the target cross-section le lecture. We learned that the signal-to-noise ratio is a very strong function of, of the range to the target. One signal-to-noise ratio is proportional to 1 over r to the fourth. So the range to the target from the radar, that distance is a very important factor. And lastly, the properties of the medium that uh, the radar is propagating through. Um, as we'll call, as we, you'll see, we call in the you'll see in the next lecture on propagation, we call that the soup. What it has to all go through. There'll be attenuation of the electromagnetic wave versus frequency, and there'll be uh, rain requirements. You know, if the how how does an electromagnetic wave propagate through rain and fog and things like that? They all come into play, and what comes out is a signal to noise power ratio, we call it S over N or SNR, and, and that gives you an average sense of how big the power is of the signal relative to the power of the noise. And I said, in a general sense, we like that to be about 20, and that's 13 dB. Okay, and it will, it will, it will, for other characteristics you'll see in the de when we learn about the detection process and later on, sometimes you want it greater than 20. But you wanted, you know, a good factor of 10, 
10 to at least 10, 20, or 35 or so, up in the 20, up in the uh, 13 dB to 17 or 18 dB, depending on other properties, target fluctuations, which I'll mention in a minute, and uh, other properties. But you want it up there pretty heavily. You want the two uh, average powers separated with the target being bigger by at least an order of magnitude. Okay? But what, what's this detection process? Well, it turns out, if you turn on a radio receiver, and you just go to a, some frequency, and you listen, you, you don't hear just one amplitude. You hear the amplitude going up and down. We call that static, you know, that's zzzz. And that's because the noise moves up and down. It, it fluctuates. It's a probabilistic thing in math called a random variable. And it, it fluctuates, and it's got an average power, but that it, it's not, you're not certain at any given measurement to the, at any given time what the actual value of the noise is because it's fluctuating up and down around that average power. Okay, so it's a random variable and also it turns out, um, excuse me, it right down here is that that's called the noise statistics. Most of the noise is Gaussian, most of the regular receiver noises, but there are other kinds of noises that can predominate. Noise from the atmosphere for certain radars in the uh, tens of megahertz frequency. And actually, this is a time I want to take just a little sidebar. You know, they read a book and a textbook and they have down in the corner a little box and a little sidebar to explain something. So I'll get back to noise in a minute, but this is something that I probably didn't go over in enough care in lecture one, and I just want to take a second to go over it. And it has to do with the whole electromagnetic spectrum. When you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, as you think back for a minute, there was the HF portion, which is in the tens of megahertz, you know, uh, tens of meters, you know, in frequency and in wavelength. And then you moved up in a frequency, and you got to the very high frequency, VHF. Okay, the first was HF, then VHF. And VHF, I'll just say, is like 150 megahertz, uh, approximately a meter and a half. And then ultra-high frequency, about 435 megahertz. Okay? And then, uh, then you get over into what we call the microwave, the microwave region. Okay? And that goes from, like, L-band as we're moving up, that's about a, 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 a thousand megahertz or a gigahertz, at 1.2 is where the radars operate. And then, then we go up into the gigahertz region, we're in the gigahertz at L band, you know, uh, a thousand megahertz is a gigahertz. And then we go up to uh, tens of gigahertz, and some radars operate up even higher with millimeter wavelengths at 35 or 90 gigahertz. Now, when we talk about propagation in the propagation lecture that's going to be coming up next, sometimes we'll just say um, uh, there's a propagation in effect that at high frequencies, uh, it, it's, it's more than at low frequencies. When we say in these next lectures high and low frequencies, we don't mean the frequencies way back down there of 10 megahertz, which are the HF region. There's sort of an ambiguity in the way people talk about it. We mean the high frequency portion of the microwave region, okay, or the low frequency portion of the microwave region. And we don't say of the microwave region when we refer it, we say high frequency or low frequency, okay. So I want to, as we continue on, everything else pretty much will be just about um, the microwave region of the entire electromagnetic spectrum, and so that differentiates from the high frequency portion that which is down a very long wavelengths and uh, that's the end of the sidebar. Okay, now let's continue on. Uh, so I don't want you later on uh, back to the sidebar to get confused and say what did they mean back there? What did they mean back there? Okay, now as I said the noise statistics typically for a microwave radar uh, are Gaussian but if you're operating at some frequencies, 
and they would be the frequencies around 10 megahertz. You can have uh, noise that isn't Gaussian. So you have to worry about the noise statistics, and noise is a statistical property. Now let's move up to the target. Now let's consider, the, the, we mentioned that the target cross-section changes with aspect angle, with angle, okay? And the target can move while you're looking at it. But there are an awful lot of targets, as you'll see in the um, radar cross-section lecture when we show you the actual cross-section of the target as a function of aspect angle, that their contributions to the cross-section come from all different parts of the target. Most targets that you see, think of an airplane, are made up of a lot of different sub-targets. The radar range cell is much bigger in most cases than the target itself. So that you're going to get scattering from the jet inlets. Let's just pick a 747. You're going to get scattering from the nose of the aircraft. You're going to get scattering from the edge of the wing. You're going to get scattering from the jet engine inlets. You're going to get scattering from the back elevators. You're going to get uh, and the uh, horizontal stabilizers. And if you and that's if you're looking nose on. If you're looking on the side. You'll get scattering from the wingtips. You'll get scattering from a big specula from the side of the aircraft. And you'll get scattering from the sides of the jet engines that are underneath the wings. And if it's at other angles, all sorts of things. Now, all these different scattering centers um, add coherently to give you the echo that goes back to the target. Okay? Now, if, and, the, and these can add constructively and destructively. They're all electromagnetic waves with phases in and out. And remember, if you're dealing with wavelengths that are, um, say, L-band or S-band, 23 centimeters, just a small change can move one scattering center from another. Small change in orientation of the aircraft can move one scattering center from the from uh, to, to interfere with another. So that as you look at the target, just sometimes vibrations of the target can cause the target's cross-section to fluctuate up and down a little bit, and as the target moves in a more grosser manner, can have it cross-fluctuate up and down. My big point is the targets fluctuate up and down an awful lot, too, in most cases. And again, the only one that doesn't fluctuate is a sphere. How many tar times do you have a radar target that's just a sphere? Well, we do have satellites up in space that are just spheres that are used for calibration. But and in any case, um, so most targets fluctuate, and we characterize how they fluctuate with different models, and we'll get into that into the in the radar target cross in the detection actually in the detection lecture, which is where this whole business is going to be gone over in great and gory detail in lecture five. And what I want to do is to sort of bridge the gap ahead of time, steal a little bit of my thunder as to what's going on between the radar equation and that detection lecture. So feeding in to the detection process is fluctuating noise, fluctuating target, and also how we set a threshold. Ideally, you'd like the distribution of the target signal to be well separated and much higher in power than the distribution of the noise. Then you can, in between, put a nice clean threshold, and you always see the target and you never see the noise. But that isn't the case. These distributions are broad. They overlap somewhat. And there's the whole issue of setting a threshold so that you, when you do have a threshold crossing, you maximize the probability that you're detecting a target, and you minimize the probability that you're detecting noise. And what we call this probability of detecting a target, we call PD, probability of detection. It means when you do get a threshold crossing, it is indeed a target. And we call down here probability of detection noise, the PFA, probability of a false alarm. We think it's a target, but it isn't a target. So this is how this all fits together. And uh, sometimes it's good to say, uh, to hear something, 
get a, get a, it's like see the preview to a movie. This is a preview to the movie of chapter five of uh, lecture five that we'll be going over in a lecture or two, and to show you how it fits in nice and synergistically with the radar equation. Okay. Now, let's go on to the summary for the lecture. So, the radar equation provides that simple connection, algebraically, between the radar performance parameters and the design parameters. And there are different uh, radar equations for different radar functions. There's a search radar equation and a track radar equation. Sometimes early on, I, I think I we used in the view graphs surveillance and, and, and search uh, interchangeably. They're the same thing. Uh, and you can, uh, one thing you want to do is you, if you scale the radar equation, it gives you a really good feeling as to how the radar design might change it, it, to accommodate changing parameters. Like uh, if we need to double the range that the tar we have to see the target, what do we have to do to the power and the aperture? That sort of thing. Um, and a combination of the radar equation with cost and other constraints gives you an idea of what are the critical design factors. Uh, I want to just bring up with that point that we haven't at all talked about cost. And sometimes you, you can just do the radar equation and cost or technology or physical constraints can say, can't do it. And so these are key features that play into the radar design process itself. Uh, if if uh, you've only got in your budget you have to build a, a, a hundred air traffic control radars and they have to cost uh, because there's only enough of the national resources to, for a couple hundred million dollars they have to cost a couple of hundred million dollars total you know a million or two dollars a radar times a hundred a uh, couple hundred million dollars so you say what's the performance that I can get in detectability and all those other issues for a million and a half dollars a whack for a radar for each Okay, or you might, and, and so performance and the amount of money really come into play. Another thing is, you look at the ideal radar f for a, uh, to go on an airplane, and it turns out you want to build it at UHF frequencies. The design says on paper, but in fact that has to fit in the nose of an aircraft, and you've only got a meter of aperture. Well, if you can't put a, you put a UHF radar with a meter of aperture, it'll have a huge uh, beam width, which might, may not meet your accuracy requirements. So there's a lot of different uh, trade-offs. And again, technology. Sometimes things you want to do, specifications of uh, how much power you need. Maybe there isn't technology to build with the size and weight constraints to get the kind of power you want for the cost, too. So it's a complicated trade-off. And that whole field we call radar system engineering. Now, when you look at the radar equation, sometimes you can get unexpected results. And when you do that, you have to look and say, hey, did I make an algebraic mistake? Do sanity checks. See if things make sense, okay? And look for hidden variables or constraints. As I said, like constraints on of uh, transportation, uh, the emplacement of the radar, cost, technology, and try to come pair parameters with those of other real radars. That's really the best way. You look and you see the design of a certain radar. It's got certain characteristics. You say, oh, that looks like the, the FPS uh, whatever, whatever radar. You go over and you say, gee, that can't perform that well. What's the difference? So if you compare it with a real radar, a lot of times you can really um, bring yourself back to sanity and get to the best radar design. Okay, fine. Here are the references uh, that we used extensively for these for this lecture and uh, we'll move on in a little bit to the next lecture